on history is crap. <laughs> there, there's, that, that's, the, that's the technical term for it. <laughs> when you do an, a, a regression analysis on a time series that is crap, guess what you get? <laughs> But it's not, it's not just crap. It's an intentional crap. <laughs> and it's unintended, but not unanticipated crap. Okay, many of you may have heard about the famous hockey stick by uh, Michael Mann at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, guess what? Superpose on that some geopolitical phenomenon that occurred. Imagine, if you will, if the Soviet Union disbands and they have some financial, budgetary, economic issues and they shut down all of the temperature stations in Siberia. What do you think happens to the average if you take out all the cold places? It goes up. Well, guess what happens if, you know, somebody's a little lazy. And he decides he doesn't want to trudge way out in the middle of a forest. He wants to just walk out of his back door next to the heating and air conditioning unit. <laughs> so he's going, to, he's going to put the temperature station there. And here's my favorite. The fundamental theory behind global warming is, is valid. Sunlight comes in from the sun. It's UV dominant goes through, it's trans, you know, the atmosphere is transparent, heats up the earth. The earth, in black body radiation, re-radiates, but at a different wavelength, i.e. infrared. And the carbon dioxide absorbs the infrared, so it, it acts like a blanket. Well, that's pretty good, good theory. But the thing is, is carbon dioxide <coughs> is, uh, absorbed all the infrared, it absorbs certain colors of infrared. And there becomes a point where all of it is absorbed. So adding more CO2 doesn't, doesn't blanket in more infrared because it's all staying in. Guess what? That's called saturation. Guess what else? We're at saturation. So adding more CO2 into the atmosphere isn't going to make us go, you know, another 5 and 10 and 20 and 30 degrees because the spectrum is saturated. And then, you know, then I can go into the fact that it's a logarithmic absorption spectrum. Thank you. Don't want to <laughs> okay, back to cap and trade. So, so we have these permits. Well, guess what? Europe had a, an exact identical system, with one exception, I'll explain in a minute. They had that cap and trade system in place. Guess what happened to their emissions? They went up. Angela Merkel, bless her heart, said, I'm not going to impose something on my economy, i.e. the economy of Germany, that is going to further destroy jobs, further destroy our ability to function, and further destroy Germany. No, but we have hope on Obama. But the, the problem in the United States can you put a big white X here so I, I quit walking there? The problem. The, yeah, the speaker's, the speaker's going to move back. The speaker moves back. Uh, Senator Kerry and Senator Graham have been talking about a new version of Energy Security Act. Clean, Clean Energy Security Act. Fundamental of which is a new cap and trade provision recast from the Lieberman Warner one of a, about three and a half years ago. This is, you know, you'd think they would come up with a, a new approach rather than just resubmitting the same old one. I'm, I'm surprised with Senator Graham and frankly disappointed. Back when Lieberman Warner was first proposed, I and a number of other organizations, including the Congressional Budget Office, and including EPA, and including the EIA, which is the Energy Information Administration, it's an arm of 
Department of Energy, but their, their data logs, made estimates of what Lieberman Warner, a.k.a. Cary Graham, would cost the U.S. economy. This is in lost productivity, lost GDP. $1.3 trillion. Well, we heard Mr. Campbell say we've got, you know, $14 trillion total GDP. We're going to cost 10% of our GDP to implement this thing that won't do a damn bit of good anyway. Because guess what? Those emitters are going to go to China or somebody else is going to pop up in China doing the same thing. Um, it's a no-win situation. We're going to impose a cost and reap nothing in return. Even, here's another myth. And whenever you hear somebody on the street or one of your you know, liberal neighbors say something like this, slap them upside the head and give them facts. We often hear the United States has only 5% of the population but emits 20% of the greenhouse gases. Yeah, well, bless his heart, Paul Harvey used to say, well, now you're going to hear the rest of the story. <laughs> yes, we emit 20% of, well, I'm on the white spot. We emit 20% of the world's greenhouse gases. But guess what? We produce 33% of the world's goods and services. We feed and clothe and house the rest of the world, and we do it more efficiently than anybody else. We do 30% of the world's GDP, but only 20% of the emissions. The solutions that our folks in Congress are suggesting goes counter to what made this country wealthy and healthy and wise in the first place. The way that we got healthy, wealthy, and wise in the first place was by constantly improving productivity. How many man hours does it take to make a widget? How much capital, how much material? We have become more productive and hence more wealthy. You cannot create wealth by going backwards, i.e. regressing. Now, I'll give you an example. One of my favorite examples, because it keeps my business in business on occasion. The Federal Department of Energy in here in California are enamored with wind turbines. The feds want to produce 20% of our energy with wind. Here in California, you know, we're creeping up on it. We give them subsidies 150 times the subsidy of any other technology. More than wind, more than oil, more than nuclear, more than coal, more than anything. Now, in, in aggregate, it, it may not seem like that, but they're producing so little. The dollar subsidy per kilowatt hour produced is astronomical. But it's worse than that. Has anybody heard the phenomenon or the, the theory of infant industry where governments start new industries when they're, when they're babies? You know, when they're just starting out. Well, it's, it's like, a, like a government incubator. But when an industry is first starting, and in order to get a leg up and you know, be treated fairly, uh, they impose what they refer to as infant industry, and they, they give them subsidies or favoritism or whatever it happens to be. I've been doing this for 40 years. Wind turbines have had infant industry all those 40 years. I mean, for God's sakes, here's a college graduate still living at home with his mom. <laughs> the idea behind wind turbines is, well, it reduces the, the consumption of fossil fuel. I'm here to tell you it doesn't. And here's why it doesn't. Electricity is, is a fine thing. But it's what I refer to as a Stevie Wonder phenomenon. It's got to be in perfect harmony. Supply and demand, frequency, voltage, everything has to be in perfect harmony. So when the wind's blowing, which it does sometimes, other power plants have to turn down. When the wind slows down and quits blowing, the other power plants have to speed up. So there are, you know, these other power plants are speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down. 